My name is Alon Nava, and uh, today we're going to talk about everything. Because we have about, uh, I don't know, half an hour to an hour to squeeze everything that I wanted to talk about. So we're going to have a very interesting uh, sitting. And Bezad Hashem, after that, we'll have time to, to do some uh, questions and answers and whatever. We'll see how much, how much we can squeeze into what little time we have. So, first I'm going to introduce myself and a little bit about my personal story, which is uh, not so easy to do because uh, the regular uh, average lecture about my personal story, how I became observant, that in itself is five hours. So we're going to have to do today the promo uh, of everything. And I also want to talk about a very important other issue, topic, and uh, more uh, uh, um, with our times, is that the fact that tomorrow is Tisha B'Av, tomorrow night. And Tuesday is the day of the fast, which Tisha B'Av is a very dominating uh, day on the Jewish calendar, which of course represents many things. And when we have a very specific event on, a, on the Jewish calendar, it's good to know not only what happened, but what needs to be done. Because the way how the system works in this world is the Kadosh Baruch who create everything in a way that everything goes in circles and everything that we do always will return to the same, to, to the first step. Bring us back to the, to the beginning. So Bezad Hashem will have a lot more to talk about. But without further ado, for the ones, I'm sure some of you do know me, but a little bit of a background that I came, uh, I was born and raised in the uh, Eretz Israel, and I was uh, raised the most unreligious you can imagine. Uh, I, uh, the right way to say it, I was born secular and I was raised the most secular you can imagine in Israel. And the Israelis that you know that are secular, that's how I was. I was against the Torah, against Hashem, hating the religious people, and that's how I grew up. And uh, since I was already 12, 13, 14, I already started showing signs of a very rebellious individual, and I went on a path of uh, a lot, a lot of uh, problems, let's put it this way. I wasn't a, a regular kid. I was a big troublemaker. I got thrown out of every school possible. I was in boarding schools. I was always in, in trouble with the, with the law. I'm talking about as a teenager. And uh, my poor parents, my poor parents that I always say, my mom, she has a place in Gan Eden for sure. <laughs> she doesn't have to do much, what, what, uh, what I put her through. And my father uh, rides on the ticket. Every time I tell him, you know, maybe you do a mitzvah or do something uh, to thank Hashem, he says, no, 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 I, I, I'm not worried. I'm going to go up to Shamaim and I'm going to tell them you're my son. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so he, uh, he writes on the fact that uh, I'm his son, which he's right, but uh, the son, uh, whatever the children do, does cover for the parents spiritually. But nevertheless, every person has to do their part too. It's not that you can just count on somebody doing your uh, work. But uh, after uh, uh, being a... Uh, Troublemaker teenager, I was in the army, also in the army I was caused a lot of problems and after the army I, uh, I got in a lot in trouble in, in Israel and I found that the best way would be to leave Eretz Israel and to come and live in the United States and I came with a dream that I'm going to come back to Israel in a few years uh, with a lot, lot of money and I went to pursue that dream. And for a few good years, uh, all my 20s, from 21, 22 till uh, about 27 that I had my clinical death. Then I uh, was a loose cannon and unfortunately I went down a very, very difficult, a horrible path where I abused drugs for many, many years and I was constantly active in illegal activities from anything you can just imagine to stuff that if I, if I tell you, you wouldn't even believe. But I end up finding myself a, a full-blown drug dealer, criminal here in the United States. By the age of 26, I had about $50 million. Mm -hmm. And I lived like a rock star. Needless to say, I lived a life of a full-blown gangster. 
Uh, now there's no time to elaborate on that, maybe another time. But eventually, uh, having the FBI and the DEA on my back, they were on, uh, trying to figure out what I'm doing for about three years. Eventually, they closed down. In the process, when I was almost 27, and uh, I used to uh, produce parties. Now that you saw in the October 7 massacre, I'm sure you saw that a big part of the attack was on a party. That's exactly the parties I used to do. I used to produce these type of parties. In Israel, we call them trans parties because of the music that is played there. And here in America, they call them raves. And in one of my own parties, I uh, consumed way too much drugs that caused my heart to stop. And I flatlined. I died, basically. And I was clinically dead for seven minutes. Uh, which in these seven minutes, I'm going to uh, skip now. We'll go back to that, because I'm sure some of you are interested to hear. But uh, that changed my life completely. I was up until that point, uh, maybe we'll, we'll show you on one of the phones, or you just go to, YouTube, to Google, write Alona Nava before pictures, and you'll see how I looked. I had long hair, my body is covered with tattoos, earrings everywhere, my nose, my lips, my ears. I didn't look like this, I looked like a complete uh, psychopath. And, uh, and this experience totally changed my life because uh, I'll share with you in a few moments some more details, but what happened was my soul left my body, and then I saw, in one word, I saw everything, I saw the truth. And that in itself, you go to YouTube, you'll find a three-hour lecture just saying 2% of the experience itself. And from that point, of course, I started changing my path of uh, going in the path of Torah, which wasn't so simple and wasn't easy. I was 27 years old, and I had a lot, a lot of uh, baggage with me. Uh, Kadosh Baruch had his own plans. A little bit over a year after the near-death experience, the FBI and the DA caught up with me, and they arrested me. Which that in itself is a story uh, that for the last 20 years nobody knew uh, many details because I couldn't say. Now, after 20 years, now I can uh, start uh, opening my mouth a little bit. Statue of limitation, years pass, so I can start talking about certain things that brought me. That, 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 that's what uh, interested me so many years. 20 years I lecture all over the world about how I became religious because of my near-death experience. I was asked any question you can just imagine. What drugs did you take? What happened here? Why this? Why that? One question nobody, nobody stopped to uh, either care or know or ask. Nobody ever asked me what preceded the, the, the near-death experience. I mean, how does a 27-year-old man suddenly drop dead? I mean, this is not uh, an, in a scenario of an engineer or a lawyer. Uh, some norm, normal individual, a person uh, to reach to such a point in itself is how did you get, go, get, come to such a place? So, for, like I said, for 20 years I couldn't say anything. A, it's uh, been, uh, not embarrassing, but not uh, uh, great credit to my resume. On the other hand, um, many w might say it is the credit of the resume. Because to be born into a righteous family and to learn Torah and to become observant, that's not a big deal. But to become observant from being uh, completely on the other side, that's a big deal. So don't take it personal, but I don't care what people think about me, if you haven't noticed. I, if I would operate by caring what people think about me, I wouldn't be anywhere because I have... Um, a large amount of people who think positive about me and my life and my changes and a lot of people don't. The other day, we had a guest. We have a, a, a learning center, a big learning, Torah learning center in Tzfat. And uh, we have uh, rooms there where we host people who come to learn Torah. Beautiful, gorgeous rooms. It was a five-star hotel. It wasn't, it's not like some uh, cheap building. And somebody stayed there the other day for Shabbat. And we were talking and he told me that uh, he started following me many years ago. I changed his life, etc., etc. And then I said something and he said, oh yeah, I did this and this exactly how you teach. So I said, oh, I'm happy to meet one of my students. Oh, he says, oh, you have millions of them. I said, no, I don't. He says, no, no, you have millions of students. I said, I have millions of followers. Students, I don't have a lot. Followers, anyone can follow me. 
Half the people who follow me don't even like me. They listen to what I say, waiting for me to stumble, to say something that is inappropriate, so they can come and say, yeah, see, he's fake, he's false. So followers, it's not, uh, that's, that's millions. Students are the ones who listen and they apply. And like that, there's not a lot. There's not a lot of people who actually listen and apply. So, with no question, the master of the universe, the Kadosh Baruch who already designed how my life will be and what path I'm going to go on, because nothing really makes sense in my life. Nothing really makes sense in my life. Even the entire episode with the law. I mean, I was really very, very, in a very, very bad place in regards to my activities. To give you a two-minute synopsis so that you understand to what extent I came to the United States and I would produce these big parties. And I would make a lot of money, also in Israel. I always had a good sense how to make money. I came in, chick chuck and I would start producing the parties and make money. But then I, I re realized that the money-making part of the party is not the party, it's the drugs. So if I could be the only one who sells the drugs in my own parties, that's it, I capital on both directions. So that's how it started. And then of course, you know, it says in the Gemara, If a person wants to do tshuva, change their way, to purify themselves, clean their thoughts, then they get help from above. Because without help from above, you can't do nothing. But the same Gemara says, If you're coming, stepping forward because you want to be impure, then they open all the gates of Gainon for you. Here, come, walk in. So the Kadosh Baruch already knew to what path I'm interested, so he opened all the gates of Gehenom and says, here, and made me successful. How I got out of jail, that's a story in itself. That's a miracle in itself. For 20 years, I tell people how I came back from the world above to this and do tshuva. For 20 years, my wife was saying all the time, you're saying the wrong miracle. The miracle is how you got out of jail. Because that is where God intervened and showed his powers. Because against all odds, I, I got out of this case like this, with nothing. Thousand dollar fine and a year probation. And so many other miracles that you can't even imagine. And everything, everybody else that was arrested in the case, half are still in jail. That's when you give Hashem the opportunity to do a miracle in the world, He can do things that you can't even imagine what Hashem can do. Just give Him the opportunity and He will do things in this world that you can't even imagine can be done. The problem is that most people don't reach to the level of belief that they're letting God operate in the world. And I'm talking about serious things. I'm not talking about that I was fighting a fine. I was facing 40 years in jail in a federal prison. How do you get out of that? When, you're, when it's obvious that you're guilty. That's only Hashem taking the puppet of a judge and making him say whatever he wants. Because if Hashem wants somebody to be alive, he'll be alive. If Hashem wants somebody to be free, he'll, he'll make him free. And nothing in my life makes sense. Everything in my life is not, not normal. And needless to say that after that, the change uh, was very, very fast. It wasn't so, uh, so short. We're talking about a, year, a three year period here <coughs> of a lot, a lot of challenges and a lot, a lot of hardship and a lot of tests. And my tests were stretched out in levels that you, you can't imagine. That's when Hashem wants to test somebody. They, Hashem can uh, take a person from one side of the world to the other side of the world. But I can tell you already that if you hold on to Hashem, Hashem can do whatever He wants. Anything that He wants. The first miracle is just transforming how I was to how I'm now. That in itself takes only a miracle of God to be able to pull its individual and to make Him change. Two months ago before I came here, uh, a father of one of the boys, unfortunately, they were murdered in the, in the party, invited me to speak. They wanted to make an evening for Ilu Nishmat. Very sad story. It's three uh, men that are best friends. Their sons are also best friends. They went to the party, five guys, three were murdered, two came back. So, and we did a lecture at Leilu Nishmat and to talk and to, Be'ezrat Hashem, to, to strengthen them. And I was telling them the full version of my story. And, you know, it's, 
It's, uh, it's interesting and inspiring to hear, but there was a person in the crowd that was standing and smiling the whole time. And then towards then, when it became more personal and we were sitting and talking, then the person who was smiling behind the whole time says, for you, this is all a story. I know him. I know him since he was a soldier. I, I saw the man in act. What he's telling you, it's not an invention. I saw this with my own eyes. So I was like, oh, good, thank you. I need to walk around with some people like that when I go to lectures. Because he was like, you don't understand. You're looking now at a nice, refined uh, individual. That's not the person that you would talk to 30 years ago. He was like, I, I knew him. Nobody wanted to deal with him. Everybody was afraid of him. He was like... So uh, th it's very hard for a person to look at this and then to picture 30 years ago the change. But that's only the power of Hashem. When Hashem touches something, if He wants, a dead person will be alive, a poor person will be rich. Anything that you can just imagine. The problem is that we don't have Imuna. Now I want to tell you, with three minutes to five minutes, the, the very express version of how I changed my perspective completely. Because I, like I told you, I grew up as secular as it comes. I didn't believe in anything. The, the, the most not connected to Judaism. Never went to a Knesset, never did a Kiddush, never did anything. Secular, like, it's not, even, it's not even what you have in America, reform. It's nothing. It's like, and the story itself, it's almost impossible to say in short, uh, in short segments or a short story. But the shortest, sh shortest version was, I was almost 27, and we made a party for Pesach. It was a Pesach party. Just, uh, just, how, uh, just imagine the, 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 the stupidity. And we wanted to do a party for Lichvod Pesach, and uh, most of our crowd was Israelis. And at that year, Pesach fell on Shabbat. Uh, Erev, sorry, uh, Erev Pesach was Motzei Shabbat, and the party was Friday. And uh, it was my party, I produced it. Somewhere in the middle, uh, unfortunately, well, maybe not unfortunately, but I took way too much drugs, which caused my heart to stop, and then, and then I knew I'm about to die. When everything started, I was blacked out, then I kind of came back to to some coherence, and I knew I'm about to die. And there's no other word to, uh, there's no way to describe it. It's almost like when you, if you're happy, you know you're happy. If you're hungry, you know you're hungry. You don't need somebody to come and tell you, by the way, you're hungry right now. So I knew I'm about to die. I think one of the most powerful parts of the entire encounter is that when I went out of the building, because I started feeling very sick, very weak, all I wanted to do is go home, so I went into a taxi. And I'm sitting in the back seat of the taxi, and in my mind I know that I'm about to die. I look outside the window, and it's like as if the whole world froze. Like I'm looking and the world is a picture. And everything stopped completely, and in my mind all that I can think of, that that's it, I'm about to leave this world, and I have nothing in my hands. I don't even have half a mitzvah to take with me. And at this point, I, when I say I understood and knew everything, I understood and knew everything. I knew that there's a creator to the world. I knew I'm about to meet him. It's like in, a, in one second, the veil is removed. And you have three, four seconds before you leave this world and everything is revealed. Hashem is giving you the last opportunity to do tshuva. That's how I felt. And I cannot even express how the feeling of disappointment feel. That I lived my life for 27 years. And now I'm leaving the world and I have nothing to show in the world above. Not even one good deed. Now how do you go up to the heavens when you know that Hashem is waiting for you to come with some mitzvot? Now every person has uh, whatever Hashem wants them to do in this world, but some people do some, some people do a little, some people don't do nothing. I don't even know where it came from. I covered my eyes and I said, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokein Hashem Echad which, of course, then, where would I even know how to say Shema Yisrael? And that's when the Neshama is, knows that it's about to leave. Then that was literally the last mitzvah 
that I could grab on the way out. Because for a man to say Shema Israel, it's a mitzvah d'oraita, from the Torah. So I was able to grab one mitzvah on the way out. But as I said Shema Israel, I felt that my body is falling on the girl that was next to me. It was all in a, in a taxi in New York. I remember seeing the partition of the, between the front and the back. And the next thing I remember is that I'm diving out of my eyes. And I wake up in this weird place. I don't hear anything. I don't see anything. I don't feel anything. All I'm noticing that there's no time, there's no sound, and there's no space. There's nothing. To, there's, there's nothing. And very quickly, as I'm trying to figure out what's going on, the same way that we all have like this voice that's in our mind that's talking to you all day long, though I, have, I had this voice and I was like, what's going on? Where am I? What, what is this place? And this voice was answering and telling me, you died. This is your death. It was kind of like pointing down. And I'm looking down like this. And it looked like in the height, like of the ceiling. And I see my body. I see the whole scene from above. And the car is driving in Manhattan. And I'm like going higher and higher and higher. And I see everything. I hear, I, I mean, there, there's no uh, sound. There's no time. There's no uh, uh, space. But I understand everything. And then started happening like a chain of events. I started, like I dived into this girl's body that I was on. I saw her entire life, every little encounter in her life. It's like I was sitting in her body and seeing all her life. And then I was going higher and higher and higher and I, got, and I saw everything that was around me as one entity. Not as a, a, you know, many, many people. And I was able to like hear everybody's thoughts because I was going in the city in Manhattan. The car was driving. I was like above the car like a like a magnet flying over the car and I'm going higher and higher and at some point I was the height of like 10 floors, 15 floors and I'm going through the building, it's like I scan and I see everything in the building. I mean just this can take hours and hours to explain every little detail, how it looked, how I, I saw everything. And at this point everything was amazing. But very quickly that kind of flipped. It felt like I was hold, held by this black scary entity that was like squashing me that eventually like kind of pulled me through this uh, long 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 tunnel and like I'm sure you heard from many where there's a light at the end of the tunnel I saw the light in the beginning like a dot of light then it became bigger and bigger which I knew behind this light is Hashem and at some point like as if from the light like something reached out touched me pulled me into the light and within split seconds like as if Everything opened and all the wisdom of the universe was like downloaded into me. It's like I knew everything and everything. I was like a genius knowing all the secrets of the world. But very quickly it was understood that I have nothing to do there. It actually felt like I'm stuck in a bubble and I see everything and I'm trying to like grab it and I can't. And they're telling me you have nothing to do here. I mean you, you, you have not even half a mitzvah. Then I was thrown out of that dimension into like this massive, huge, huge room where I'm standing in the middle like completely naked. Naked. But not naked from clothes. There wasn't a body there. It was just a soul. But completely, completely naked. Naked from its what? And all around me were like, like a ring of millions and millions of eyes. All the souls of all generations are all looking at me and they're like looking through me. And I'm naked, so they see through me, and they see everything that I ever did, everything that I ever say, and the only feeling there is only shame. Shame that you can't even imagine. All the sins that I did are all in the air, and everybody reads everything that I did, and you don't know what to do with yourself from the shame. And needless to say that this shame was between me and the souls. It literally felt that I'm standing like this, and it felt that if I lift up my head, I see a shame. That's how it felt. I couldn't lift up my head from the shame. It literally felt like God was telling me, what are you doing? I sent you down to the world with a list this long of things to do and a list this long of things not to do. Everything I told you to do, you didn't do. Everything I told you not to do, you did. You didn't even get one thing right. And I knew that if they're taking me to the next room, then story's over and I was begging like leave me here with all this shame leave me here for eternity just don't take me to the next room 
And sure enough, I've been pulled into the other room, which very quickly I understood that it's a courtroom. And they, they started uh, my, in my personal court case, where they, oh, of course, offered nicely if I have anything to say. But then they showed me the movie of my life, but it wasn't like on a big screen. It's like as if they put me back into my body, but this time life is like very slow motion and I'm standing on the side the whole time and I see everything. Every encounter that I had in my life, I'm back there. This time I'm like Google Earth. I'm, I'm like 40 cameras. I'm, I see everything from all directions. And not only that, let's say we have a scene like this. Uh, so I see myself, and then I see myself from the eyes of each and every one of you. And what are you thinking? But they only show me everything that I did. Here you stole, here you lied, here you cheated, here you cursed, here you did that. And you, you can't like argue anything. It's like as if, I'm not exaggerating, like as if there's like 150 cameras and you see all directions. And everybody in the room, any person that I ever did to, is standing next to me. Like subpoenaed to testify what I did. All the souls, even the people who are alive. I mean, what do you think you do when you go to sleep? When you go to sleep, your soul goes up to the heavens to do a few stops. And one of the things is to go and testify in other souls' courts. He stole from me. He cheated from me. On the complete opposite. He helped me. Every person that I ever did anything to was standing next to me. And everything is pointed out. Here you stole, here you cheated, here you did this, here you did this. Like as if they're telling me, uh, you, have, you have nothing. You know, what do you have here? Uh, a mitzvah and a half. Which really I didn't have nothing. But for whatever reason, they decide to give me another chance and they gave me three options. Option number one, first of all, I come back into this world, is that I have to become Choser B'Tshuva and live my life like an observant Jew. And they're showing me like a movie all the way forward of my entire life. From that day, and I see myself with a beard, and I see how I look, I see my wife, I see all my kids, I see my entire life forward, they were telling me, that's how you have to live your life. You can't like, uh, you can't go and distort it the way. That's the path you need to go on. This is what you need to do, and you accept, you accept. No, no. Option number two, no, no, option number two. Uh, uh, condition number two is that I had to pay back my debts. They told me, from 0 to 13, we uh, forgive you for everything, okay? From 13 to 27, then you're, you're responsible for everything yourself. Whatever you ch stole, you have to give back. You, whatever you took money, you have to do tshuva. Uh, doing tshuva is not putting a yarmulke on the head and saying, okay, from this day on I change. Is fix back 15 years. Not so simple. That's the real tshuva. A lot of people become choser b'tshuva. They do three, four things. They don't understand. They have to fix back. And the third uh, 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 condition that they said is that I have to say the story. They said they can't like uh, not tell it to anyone. Which I can tell you already. First few years was very embarrassing to sit in front of a crowd of people and to tell them, yeah, this is how I was. This is what I did. And let me tell you the story that sounds completely crazy. But like I told you in the beginning, I have thick skin. I, I don't care what people think. I'm here for Hashem, not to convince somebody, to make somebody happy. I come to talk, to say what Hashem wants. You take from it whatever you want. You want to like me, hate me, follow me. You can do whatever you want. I'm here to give the message and I leave. Needless to say that I accepted the terms, shake the deal. The second that I accepted the deal, it felt like God punched me. It felt like a train hit me. And I woke up in, in this world. Of course, took a long time, took about a year till I started even getting observant. You know, 27 years old, it's not that you wake up the next day and, and you're, and that's it. I started with just putting tefillin and not eating meat and dairy. It was a very interesting year how I slowly, slowly changed my way. The missing piece, the missing puzzle piece that many people didn't have for so many years is that after that year, then I was in jail. And the jail was really the tshuva. That's where I did tshuva. Because it wasn't fun there. It wasn't fun there at all, at all. And uh, that's really when I started screaming to Hashem. As David HaMelech says in Tehilim, Mimamakim kraticha Hashem. I have called you Hashem from the depth. When you reach rock bottom and you know that's it, that you can't go more down. What else can be after this? 
That's when you, if you're smart, you start looking up and start calling for Hashem. So really, months over months, my tshuva was done in a four walls cement. Not in a yeshiva with nice air conditioning and a good pizza and a good rabbi that tells you what to do. My tshuva came very, very difficult. Very, very difficult. And needless to say, when Hashem wants something, somebody to be successful, if you're just holding on to Hashem, Hashem can turn the world upside down. And that's what most people don't understand. They come to a certain test in their life. Everybody's tested at one point in their life with severe things. And then Hashem is testing you, how much do you believe in me? Do you believe I can do whatever I want? Now most people will tell you, in theory, I believe in God and I believe He can do whatever He wants. Right? Right now, you all agree with me that there's a creator to the world and if he wants he can do whatever he wants that's in theory now face a challenge and I want to see you going through the fire and saying there is no fire because Hashem is in control of everything and that's really what Hashem is pushing everybody because you all believe that there's a creator but when you're facing a very severe challenge you don't believe that Hashem can change it and that's where Hashem is testing you all the time. And He will bring you all the way to the edge. And if you are a believer, then Hashem, like He did to Bnei Israel and open the sea for them, Hashem can do whatever He wants for you. I saw with my own eyes tumors disappear, law cases, like cases in, in, in uh, courts that nothing happened. I mean, things that you can't even imagine. If you have a in Hashem, I mean, uh, I don't need to see it in other places. I experienced it on myself maybe 300 times in situations that it, no way can be this way and it went that way. That's where Hashem says, I run the world. No president, no doctor, no judge, nothing. I run the world. Somebody just told me the other day because I, I mentioned this uh, story. So somebody on the way back told me, you know, also Yosef Fatsadik was in jail. I said, I'm familiar with the story. I read the Torah a few times. I, I, I remember vaguely, but I remember that most Yosef was in jail. I told him it wasn't only Yosef. It's that most of our leaders were in jail. Most people don't know. Moshe Rabbeinu was in jail for 10 years. And you know who jailed him? His father-in-law, Itro. So if you want to hear a little bit more about Moshe Rabbeinu, I gave a class on Zayn Nadar a few months ago about his life. Somebody asked, can you do a, a, life, a, a lecture about the life of Moshe Rabbeinu, the, our leader? Nobody knows nothing about him. He ran away from the house of Paro when he was 18, disappeared for 62 years, and he appears again at the time of the burning bush. Where was he 62 years? So 10 years out of the 62, he was in jail. Also Yosef. But what that person pointed out, the story of Yosef says that he was in jail for 10 years. And then the minister of the baker, like the minister of baking and the minister of the, of the, the main chef, or whatever you want to call it, Sarat Abachim, they got released, they were in jail. And um, you know the story, Yosef sold the dream. And, uh, and they were released. And Yosef told uh, the Sarah Mashkim, please, if you can say a good word for Paro about me. Shem didn't like that, and he, now he left him in jail another year. He told you, uh, Hashem told Yosef, you need to ask one of the ministers to you, throw a good word for you. Uh, I'm running the show here. I will decide when you go out of jail, and for what and how. But that's, that's the reality. That if you're looking at all of our great leaders, Moshe Rabbeinu, David HaMelech, so many of the leaders, A, were always jailed. <laughs> Some, something has to be in jail. But... Nevertheless, we've seen all the encounters that Hashem puts his foot forward and says, I run the show. I run the show. That's really the ultimate message when I need to give over a message to people is to, uh, to start understanding that Hashem runs the show. The Torah calls it in three words, En Od Mil Vado. There is nothing but Hashem. Now, whenever you put Hashem first priority and Hashem is number one, then you see that your life runs on miracles. 99% of the people, they don't put Hashem number one, they put Hashem number two, number three, number four, whatever, however it works. If you want to be smart, 
I uh, believe, that's how I operate, that in any encounter that I have, I need to take something out of it to learn from that. If not, then why did Hashem make me bump into people, see people, learn from people? Most people, their ego is so high, they don't see how another person can teach them anything. I did, I know, you will tell me. But David HaMelech says very clearly, I have learned from all of my teachers, even from Achitofel, who Achitofel was against David HaMelech, and gave him advice that was completely wrong. Nevertheless, David Amir says, I have even learned from my enemies, I learned something. As the sages say, everything that you look, you, have to, you can learn something from. Smart people usually don't have egos. I mean, there are very wise people, and that has nothing to do with their ego. Smart people don't have an ego. Because a smart person says, I can learn from every person. I can learn from you and you and you. How I look at people is not that I'm better than them because I achieved A, B, and C. I can pull out now my list of achievements. It's not bad. I can probably say I'm doing better than many others. But that's not an attitude. That's not how you look at the world. I look at the world completely different. That every person that sits in front of me, yes, I'm better than them in three, four things. But they're better than me in a few things, right? That's how it is. Each and every one of you is better than me in many things that I'm not good at. One is a better cook, one is a better father, one is a better teacher, one is a better banker, one is a better businessman, I don't know. I know what I'm good at. But when I look at another person, I'm looking for what, uh, what are they better in me than me? And that means I can learn something from them. And that can only be done if you know how to humble yourself and say, okay, I, I don't know who you are. Besides, if you here, most of you never met me. Now, how do, I, how do I see that in practical? Imagine now, you guys never met me. Half of you never met me. But you heard from the host, oh, you can't imagine what an amazing rabbi is coming. She didn't tell you he was once a drug dealer, a drug addict. She just says he was a, an amazing rabbi. You, you heard that. Can you imagine she would tell you, I want you to meet an ex-drug dealer, ex-drug addict, uh, he might have a few good words uh, to tell you, like, I'm eh, not too sure that's who I want to meet. He, he, that's what's going to teach me. And that's what leads me to the next part that is uh, connected to the day that we're going to be commemorating yesterday, tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to be commemorating many bad things that happened to us as a Jewish nation. First of all, even before Tisha B'Av, we ha I'm sorry, on Tisha B'Av, before the destruction of the temple, bad things happen. The, 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 many, many th bad things happen in Tisha B'Av, not only the destructions of the temple. Twice. I mean, what are the odds? Two temples get destroyed on the same day. So, I'm sure you heard it not once and not twice, that the first temple was destroyed because of idolatry, because of bloodshed, and because of for forbidden relations. The three major sins that we all have issues with, and that's the major sins that we all struggle from the beginning, the creation of the world. Idolatry, avodah zarah, incest, forbidden relations, gilu erayot, and bloodshed, shfichut demim. And bloodshed is not necessarily sticking a knife into somebody's back. You slander somebody publicly, then you spill their blood. You're a murderer, according to the Torah. So the first temple was destroyed because of these three things. Since the sin that I just mentioned is a revealed sin, which means if you do idolatry, it's revealed. Everybody sees it, unless you're in a little room. But the idolatry, the bloodshed, and the forbidden relations, it's obvious sins. Since the sin was revealed, then the length of the exile was revealed. They, the, 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 the Bnei Israel, the nation of Israel, is living in Yerushalayim, and the prophet is telling them, 70 years, you're back. You're making a U-turn in 70 years. And sure enough, 70 years later, the story with Purim, you're all familiar. Well, 68 years later was the story with Purim, with the Hashverosh, Haman, Mordechai. You know the story, close to home. And then two years later, everybody made a U-turn, came back to El Tisrael. Now the second temple was destroyed for something completely different. For what is called Sinat Chinam, baseless hate. 
Since the sin is not revealed, you don't know if I hate you or not. I can now look at you and smile at you. Yes, sir. No, sir. You're amazing. Kiss your toches from morning to night. And inside, I hate your guts. And I can't stand you. And I trash you whenever I can. But I, you're my boss. you whatever. You're my in-laws or something. I don't know. Something that I need to like... But I can't stand you. And that's like the one example out of many. The baseless hate is that I hate a person with no reason. And that's what destroyed the second temple. Our sages explain, since the sin is not revealed, you don't know what's in my heart, then the length of the exile is not revealed. Which means that last exile we were 70 years, this exile we were already 1950, 1957, 50, 58 years. We're not 2,000 years in exile. Don't say we're 2,000 years in exile, that's another 50 years. We're 1957 or 58. Don't catch me on the, on the ear. But we are suffering from that and will continue to suffer from that till we do any change. Until we change, nothing, nothing will get better and on the contrary, will get worse. Now, the concept of baseless hate is that I hate you for no reason. Because you're Sephardi, you're Ashkenazi, you were black, I wear white, you live in this neighborhood, I live in that neighborhood, I follow this rabbi, you follow that rabbi, I follow uh, this politician, you follow that politician. Some people hate each other because one person is a Republican and the other one is, uh, uh, is a Democrat. And they will hate each other. But why? So I, believe, I think this politician is good. You think that politician is good. We can uh, disagree. But I, why hate each other? So the baseless hate go to, to, to extension that it's not that uh, I just hate you. Because if I will approach now any person and tell them, where is your sinat chinam? No, no, I'm good with everybody. No, I don't hate anybody. Yeah, you don't hate anybody till they annoy you. Or till they say something about, about you. Or till they do something against what you believe. And the sinat chinam is very, very refined. A lot of people will say, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't care, Ashkenazi, Sephardi. But I can tell you that from my point of view, the sinat chinam is not promising anything at all. The sinat chinam is so horrible that it's, if it's in uh, between two people who are not connected to the Torah in any type of way, I can maybe say, okay, but a person who believes this much in Hashem, I'm not so like talking now Baba Sali, us, you believe this much in Hashem. And, and, and the, and the, 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 way, the way to look at it is not if how much observant you are. I know people who eat all kosher, Three times a day pray, observe Shabbat, the whole nine yards. And you would say, oh, that's a very religious person. But all day long they gossip, Lashon Ara, spew hate, and many other things that what, what is their Torah worth? What do you think in Shemaim Hashem is looking at a person that learns Torah all day long, eats kosher, keeps Shabbat, everything, super orthodox, but trashes another individual? I can tell you nothing is worth it. The, the entire Torah of this person is worthless. Shem cannot stand. You're learning Torah all day long. Mele, you were born in, I don't know what, in Alaska. I never even read one word of Torah. I can understand. You don't understand what's uh, Lashon Ara gossip. But listen, grab now any guy from the street and pull them and start talking to them. They know it's gossiping. They know it's uh, slandering. It has, <laughs> it, it, and, and they also know it's not okay, even if they didn't read in the Torah. So it has nothing to do with if you're Torah observant or not. The sad reality is that most people who are dressed like this, and that's what I found when I became observant, I want to be nice and conservative and say 50%, but uh, that's not my honest opinion. My honest opinion is much more than 50%. But the sad reality is that most people that I found that look on the external part like that, they're just dressed apart. Inside, there's no emit. There's no true, true, love to Hashem and true love to the Torah and true love to other people and listen it's very easy to be robotic and to behave a certain way and that's I can tell you one of my main things that for 20 years of me becoming observant I came from the side of rejecting the Torah and hating the people they represent the Torah 
Now I had to go in and start living with the people that for 30 years I couldn't stand. And you know what was hard? That for 30 years I wasn't wrong. That what was hard. That I had to, I used to go from one community after the other and find out oh, everything's fake. I'll never forget I came to one community out of many. In the beginning, everybody looked so hyper-religious, running in the morning with their tefillin and everybody covered top to bottom. I was like, wow, this is like the, the number one community of religious Jews in the world. Everybody looked so righteous. Three months into living there, Shem Yerachem. I would be in the synagogue, this guy doesn't come to pray because he's coming to doing business. This guy talks with the tefillin on the head. This guy cheats on his wife. This guy cheats in business. This guy does everybody. It was everything and everybody. I was like, and Sadiq Echad Besdom. It's like Sdom. Everybody's dressed apart, but nothing. Ah, here and there, one uh, a flower. And again, I'm not blaming anybody. We're all human. Not so simple to be 100%. But I don't like the fakeness, and I don't like the, the being pretentious, and unfortunately, and it is in every community, in every city is different. But nobody can argue, and nobody can say different. The level of rejection and hate towards other people is not promising at all. I can tell you on my experience that for me, it's un I unheard of. For me, it's weird that I'm coming to a city I'm leaving my town, I'm leaving my house, I'm leaving my comfort, so I can go to the United States. I'm doing now a two month tour. Two months I'm doing a tour, as all major cities. And in every city to come, to give Shurei Torah, to meet uh, students, followers. Some of the cities, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, almost, it doesn't even resonate with, I still don't know how to digest it that I'm coming and we're calling uh, shuls that I want to come and speak and give a Torah class there and shuls reject. I mean, th I, don't know how to, I, I don't know how to digest it yet. And they don't reject because, oh no, we're busy. No, him? No, oh, we don't want him. But he's coming to give Torah for free. We don't like how he talks. He's too extreme. He's this like this and like that. I never even heard of something like that. In another city, not here, in another city, there's a woman who's helping me. She came back crying after she called me. I called seven major synagogues in our city. Nobody wants you to talk there. And then people wonder why we're going to have disasters before Mashiach comes. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because you're not necessarily in that place. But everyone in us, everyone, has in them some type of like... I don't know how to call it even, but you, you tend to judge another person and say, oh, I'm better than them. Uh, why would that person, th that person doesn't benefit me anything in my life. I don't need to even look to their direction. We all have, unfortunately, this evil streak in us that we do think that we're better than other people. We do think that we're more, uh, 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 how do you say, I need to get more. And we tend to look at other people f from above to below. And I can tell you that I'm probably one of the best examples to, uh, uh, to feel it and to tell you how it feels. Because some people look up at me, wow, Rabbi Nava, Rabbi Nava. You know how many shuls that we, I come to speak or in different establishments that I went to, they don't refer to me as Rabbi Nava. They refer to me, oh, he was a drug addict. He's a criminal. From him, I'm going to learn Torah. So I don't get offended because of that. I, 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 you don't want to learn with me. Fine, I'll go and teach you. But to hear it coming from other places, again, doesn't affect me. I don't care. I know what I'm worth. But to hear that coming from another person, that's part of the Sinat Chinam. You can look at, at a person and say, there's a good chance that that person is better than me. Most people look at other people and say, <laughs> so... Tomorrow is Tisha B'Av. When I became observant, people used to tell me a very annoying uh, statement. Have a meaningful fast. How can a fast be meaningful? I'm going to be starving. I'm going to have a headache. I'm going to be weak. What's meaningful about it? I'm just doing it because Hashem told me to fast and I'm fasting. What took me many years to understand when it says the meaningful fast is that why did Hashem instate that we have a fast? Why the Chachamim said, okay, Tisha B'Av, we have to fast? Because really Hashem only said on Yom Kippur that we have to fast. Our sages added these fasts. Is not to torture us by being hungry. 
is by us to take a break and to say, why are we fasting? Ah, we're fasting because the temple was destroyed. Why was the temple destroyed? Because of Sinat Chinam. So for th uh, almost 2,000 years, nothing changed because the temple wasn't built, which means there are still, we're still sinning in the same thing as an individual and collective. So when it says to have a meaningful fast, it means that you need to sit for 24 hours and think, how can I change myself that I won't be to, b to blame or at fault at what, at what is pointed at us? That when Hashem is going to come down, at least I can say, listen, I can't say anything for the entire nation, but I tried. <laughs> I, in my little world, respected other people. I didn't step on other people. I looked at another person, I didn't look at how he's dressed and how he uh, behaves. Here in this materialistic world, if you're not dressed nice and you don't, don't look respectful, you're probably like, I don't know who you are. You look, if you look homeless, so for 24 hours, if you want your fast to be meaningful, is to think, okay, let's think what, what caused the destruction of the temple, A, B, and C type of behavior. I don't want to be involved in that type of behavior. To change the world, I won't be able to. Trust me, I'm 20 years speaking around the world. I'm affecting a minority in the world. You can change the world as much as you want. Doesn't matter how much money you have and how much money, uh, doesn't matter how smart you are. You won't change the world. The only way how you can change the world is if you change yourself. If you change yourself, you can know that you are 100% good with Hashem by saying, I changed the world. That's what you are responsible for. So when I started the lecture by telling you, don't get offended, but I don't care what people think about me, is because my goal, my target is I need to go out of the revolving door of this world, not how I came in. I came into this world a certain way, and I don't blame anybody, not my parents, not a, nobody. I came into the world a certain way. Now I'm going through the revolving door. My life is a complete chaos. And now I want to go out, which of course will be leaving this world. How do you go out of the revolving door of life? So when I'm looking at myself, I have a target. I need to change myself, my behavior, affect the world, do what I need to do. I can tell you from experience, the more you look up, the more you see nothing. The more you humble yourself, that's where you see everything that you need to do. Before I became observant, literally days after my near-death experience, uh, after I came back to some coherence, then I, I knew that I have to start putting fill-in on. And my friend who helped me, Itzik, I told him, can you help me bite fill-in? So he bought me a good pair of fill-in and a sido. And he also bought me the letters of Nachmonides, Geret HaRamban, beautifully like in a leather case. And for a whole year, that was the only Torah that I learned. I would read this Geret HaRamban, the letter of Nachmonides every day. That was my tor Torah. I recommend to you to buy a copy. You can find it in English and read it every day. It will make you a completely different person. Because for two years, that I needed to think of what Torah, I needed to have some Torah in jail. I didn't have any Torah, they didn't give me books. Not allowed to have books there. Only later on, if, if and when I would be sentenced, I would we request to move to like a, a, a less a harsh jail and maybe I could learn Torah there. But I was, I was designate, des designated to be in a maximum security prison. There's no, no books, there's no nothing. The only Torah I had was the Zigeret Ramban in my mind. And, and, and one of the things that is stuck there is that the, the, the letter asking, why would a person be prou proud of anything in this world? What are you proud of? That you have money? Hashem gives you money. You're proud that you have uh, intelligence? Hashem gives you the brain. He's basically telling you, in other words, the more humble you are, the greater Hashem will make you. He says as follows, Hashpel atzmecha v'inasecha makom. Humble yourself, Hashem is going to raise you to the level that you need to go up to and much more than what you can even understand. And needless to say, how it's affecting us on, I'm talking on a personal level, not now as a whole nation. As a nation, we're not doing great. As a nation, I'm talking a Jewish nation, it's, it's uh, shocking to me how Hashem is not have even have a, a, a patience to us after 2,000 years of Chilulei Shabbat and all that what's going on, I don't even know how Hashem has the patience to us. It's actually a miracle that He still has. But nevertheless, the Kadosh Baruch Hu is waiting for us to make a change. Now, I'm a strong believer 
That's how I teach all my classes. That's how I do, do all my lectures. I'm a strong believer that nothing happens by chance. Everything is organized from the Kadosh Baruch Hu, And nothing in this world or in your life is by mistake or by chance. You're not sitting here by mistake. Some people wanted to come, they couldn't come. You even, even you, well, when were you invited? Before Shabbat, today in the morning. So nothing happens be without the supervision of God, which means that Hashem wanted you to sit in the uh, sitting right now and listen to every word that I had to say. And He invited each and every one of you. Many wanted to come, couldn't come, couldn't find a babysitter, didn't find the place, or whatever arrangement. And some people came early, some people came late. The fact that you have to take is that the master of the universe himself invited you tonight. For you to listen and to say, what can I do to better my life and to change my life? If you're looking at me, and again, I saw all the types of individuals, how they look at me after a lecture. Some people look at me, wow, unbelievable, how did you do it? This is one out of five million is able to do such a thing. And some people would even look, look down, ah, what does he think for himself? Or many other types of uh, 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 whatever, which again, I was learned, I was taught a long time ago, smart people are quiet. I was taught by my father many, many years ago, smart people are quiet. You open your mouth, you show the world how stupid you are. Keep your mouth shut, at least people will think you're smart. But more than that, you open your mouth, you are becoming vulnerable because you start saying nonsense. And a smart person in front of you will right away catch your nonsense. So I, I was taught to do to action. Smart people do actions, don't uh, philosophize. So hopefully you're smart people and you take something and you, trans you, trans action, you translate it into action. It says in the Gemara, Gadol HaTalmud HaMavila Dei Maaseh. When does the learning become great? Is when you know how to make action out of it. If you're sitting, it doesn't matter what type of class, lecture, and you're listening, and you're taking, 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 doesn't matter, you know, it can be a business convention, you're going to a business convention, you need to listen. Or you just came to mingle. But it doesn't matter. In any situation, if you talk too much, you don't hear anything. And then you don't take what you are scheduled to take. Somebody once invited me to a class. He told me, okay, come at 7, we'll serve food, and then you can start talking. I said, no, 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 first serve, serve the food. When everybody's done eating, then I'll start talking. He said, no, 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 I want you to talk as much as possible. I said, but when I talk, when people eat and their mouth moves, the ears don't listen. So I'm losing the half an hour of the chewing. So... Smart people listen and then they process. I was the complete opposite. I had to learn the hard way. I was very impulsive. Everything that came to my direction had maybe a fraction of a second to process and right away was a reaction and the reactions were always bad. It took me many, many years to absorb and wait. What's the reaction? Wait another day or two, there'll be a reaction. Now the reaction is not gonna be good. Let me sleep on it, I'll relax, then we'll get a, you'll get a reaction. So really what I want to give you to leave this room is strong words. I don't need to prove myself to Hashem or to myself. I'm already 22 years doing tshuva. I'm past already the point that I need to prove myself if I'm, if I'm doing okay or not. At this point, I just look at my life, see the experience that I took, and now I have the obligation of giving it over. Now, as I mentioned before, you can take whatever you want from tonight. You can either take the good food or you take some message. And every person tonight heard one thing that applies to them. I went through like maybe 15 lectures tonight with all the topics. You don't, even, you don't pay attention, but I know. I get, all the topics I gave you is 15 different lectures. The near death, the arrest, the tshuva, the jail, the this, the that. So we squeezed in tonight 20 topics. Every topic probably hits a home run or should hit a home run in each and every one of you. And probably also the ones we're going to see tonight on the video. The question is what do you do with the information you get? It's very simple. 
Most people receive information. Okay, let me say it a different. Most people receive information, don't process nothing. Everything stays outside. Few people process the information. And then a minority, they digest it the right way and they know what to do with it. So I can tell you already that from every, every topic that I went through, I'm sure each and every one of you can take something. The question is how you leave the room. If you leave the room, like I told you, leaving what you can, could have taken behind, or you leave the room and you're saying, okay, I relate with this, I agree with that. I can tell you already that the point in life, if somebody would ask me, what's the point in life? What's the, my, my uh, not what's my, uh, my uh, how do you, call here in America there's a term to that, and uh, now I forgot. A lot of people ask me my uh, pur purpose. Do you know what's your purpose in life? Anyone here? No? Yes? Leave a legacy. Each person is told different purpose. Most people don't know their purpose in life because they're not willing to bow down to Hashem to hear the purpose. So they're going in a maze that keep running into dead ends. But most people don't know their purpose in life. I can tell you now on a general answer that your purpose in life is to refine yourself. And Hashem is going to put you in many different situations that the ultimate goal will be if you refine yourself or not. That's it. Most of our great sages and teachers of the Torah will tell you that the main point of our life is to refine myself. And the mitzvot and the Torah that I acquire on the way and learn and do mitzvot, that's air and food for the soul. But if I'm walking through a revolving door into this world and out, is how much I refine myself. What, how, how, what does it mean? It means that Hashem will uh, bring you to the world with a few attributes that are very good. You'll be honest, you'll be diligent, you'll be faithful, you'll be uh, whatever. And then you also get a bunch that are negative. You're quick to anger, which we all have a good uh, share in that. We're very judgmental. We are uh, quick to judge. Jealousy, sadness, depression. I mean, the bad midot are from here till tomorrow. And every person has a few bad attributes that you need to refine. So if you need to refine the attribute of anger, so Hashem is good. You'll see by yourself that you're quick to anger. So Hashem is going to put all the annoying people in your life. Your husband will be annoying, your kids will be annoying, your boss, boss, everybody will be annoying. Just to see how fast you go from zero to a hundred with, with getting upset. There's nothing wrong with your wife or your husband. If you have an issue with anger, you are the problem. And Hashem is just going to put in front of you the right people who will cause you to be angry all day long. And if you need to work on your patience, Hashem is going to give you a lot of annoying kids. And a lot of annoying uh, employees, employers, employee or... Hashem is going to put you in the surrounding that all your buttons are being pre pressed. If Hashem wants you to work on your jealousy, He's going to put you in the middle of Beverly Hills and you don't have money. <laughs> That's it. And you have to drive some stinky Honda Accord and everybody's with Mercedeses and you <laughs> work on your jealousy. Don't be jealous. And you know what? That individual works on their jealousy and refines themselves. They'll get the Mercedes and all the money they want. It's all game how Hashem is... So Hashem puts you where you need to refine yourself. If you need to refine yourself by not gossiping, because you have a tendency to gossip, then Hashem is going to put you in the circle of people that don't stop talking. That you should be... A po at some point, I can't listen to this anymore. That's what I said. Smart people, they process what's going on. Most people, like I told you, their, their, their ego is not letting them humble themselves. So, you know, when you, when you look too high, you don't see what's going on. The way to see what's going on, and which I'm talking about the signs that Hashem is giving you, is only if you humble yourself. And when you humble yourself, then Hashem starts showing you what He wants from you. So all the signs and all the tests and all the challenges, at least you understand what's going on. Most people are being challenged all day long, and they don't even know what's the challenge. 
And most of the challenges are with parnasa, with your livelihood, with finding your, your other half, marrying your kids, uh, dealing with your spouse, shalom bayit, dealing with your kids, health, that's a big department. There's constantly challenges all day long. And Hashem just wants to see a reaction. This is all under the how you refine yourself. Because Hashem is going to throw a challenge in your face and He wants to see if you lose your temper or if you're judging the other person. How many times there was a situation, you lost your temper, you lost your patience and you judged the situation completely wrong and then Hashem showed it straight into your face how wrong you are. And now is another test. Are you going to apologize? Are you going to take back your words? Are you going to do tshuva and say, you know what? I'm, gonna, I'm not going to judge, judge situations anymore. All this that I'm saying and was saying in the last 45 minutes, it's all applicable for tomorrow for Tisha B'Av. Because we're right now in exile. Some people feel the exile, some people don't feel the exile. We spoke about it in the table before we started. And I said that whenever Hashem is ready to move to the next level, He's going to make it annoying for everybody. So now he's making it annoying for everybody. Everybody's suffering. Everybody, not in this room, in this entire world, is now suffering from something. And many people, it's three things. And for the majority, it's money. For the majority, it's, it's pressure, financial pressure. And to add on that, the health, the health department. And to add on that, a few other things. Everybody's dealing with uh, pressure. I told you that already. I, might, I must look like a stone. Everybody comes to me and cries on, my, on me like I'm the Kotel Amaravi, like the Wailing Wall in, uh, in uh, Yerushalayim. Everybody comes. Nobody comes and tells me, Rabbi, life is great. I love your classes. You're doing amazing. Everybody that comes to me quietly, listen, I have this problem, I have this problem. Everybody comes to me. Like the Kotel. In the Kotel, everybody cries to the wall and they put notes there. I don't get any notes. No notes to go in my pockets. But everybody tells me, this is, a, this is a problem and this and... Everybody's having problems. You're doing fine here, then you're suffering here. Nobody right now has it good. Everybody has some type of a challenge and most people it's 10 challenges. That's it. Hashem wants our attention. Hashem is moving now to the next level. He's waking everybody up. He's going to make it very uncomfortable in the United States because He wants the Jews to start here in the United States, they were very comfortable for the last 50, 60, 70 years. That the story's over. Hashem closed already the valve a long time ago. And why? He does that before He wants you to migrate. He did that, what, 40 years ago in Iran? We just spoke about it before, before the rising of Khomeini. Everybody lived there good. Then Hashem decided to, switch, to close the switch. Now, everybody had to start running away. And the same thing in Europe 80 years ago, and the same thing in Russia 100 years ago, and the same thing everywhere. Whether it's uh, 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 Spain 500 years ago, whenever Hashem decides to kick us away from where we are, He starts making it very uncomfortable. And now collectively the entire world before Mashiach is coming, you know, a lot of people are under the impression, because that's what they were taught, that Mashiach, you know, is some person is going to come and change the world. And people don't understand that Mashiach is not working for you. And he's not the person who's going to come and change the world. And believing too much in, the, in Hashem's uh, Eved is also a problem. It says in the Torah, They believed in God. Oh, by the way, also in Moshe, his servant. A lot of people in our generation, the focus is on the man, Mashiach. They're not focusing that, it's Mashiach, that Hashem has is to come. Three times a day we're praying with the Hazena and Enu Bishuvchalit Zion Berachamim. We're praying for Hashem to return, not a human being. And unfortunately, in our faith, some people put the Mashiach number one. That's, that's like Goim, that's like uh, Christianity. Believing in a person and that he saves the, the, saves the day. Hashem saves the day. Happens to be that he sends a, a man to, to guide and to eventually be the king, the physical king. But we need to pray for Hashem to come. So Hashem is now putting everybody in their spot and telling everybody, in other words, the redemption is coming and you have to prepare yourself accordingly. And preparing yourself accordingly is first of all being okay with Hashem. Hashem says, if you are good with me, 
דוד המלך says in תהילים, יפול מצדך אלף, ורבבה מימינך, אליך לא יגש. A thousand will fall from one side, ten thousand from the other side, nothing will come to you. If I'm holding on to Hashem, then I'm, I'm going to be fine. The question you need to ask yourself, are you holding on to Hashem? One way or another. So tomorrow, when one wants to have a meaningful fast, that's what you need to think of. It's not about a destruction that happened 2,000 years ago. It's the destruction that is happening now. And I don't want to be involved in that in any type of a way. I cannot convince you all to do tshuva. 20 years I'm speaking all over the world. I never in my life choked somebody. You have to do tshuva. I tell them this is the truth. You can look at me as an example. You do whatever you want. When I'm going to come to your house in the middle of the night, knock on the door and tell you, say kirat shema. I can't tell you to do tshuva. I can only tell you this is the truth. This is the Torah. This is the truth. This is my life story. The door is there. Do whatever you want. You can't knock on your door in the middle of the night to tell you what to do. But that's the significance of tomorrow, is to understand that even in my own life, when I'm dealing with some type of a destruction, unfortunately, most people at some point in their life are, were, were dealing, if not right now, with some type of a challenge that is almost impossible to deal with. And what Hashem Echem, what people are going through. Not to talk about in Israel now, the challenges that we have there. And I know a lot of people are like, oh, Israel, Israel, don't, don't, don't do Israel. Israel. Israel is the most safest, holiest place in the world. Don't feel bad to Israel. Look what's going on in Israel and understand that it's coming to a theater near you. That's how it works. Because Hashem's land is the most safest land in the world. Nothing will happen in the, in the, in the land of Israel. I mean, you see things are happening, but in regards to at the end of the day, Israel is the safest place. Israel is where the storm starts and then it starts taking off and it starts rippling and Israel becomes the eye of the storm. So everywhere in the world is going to start being crazy. You see what's going on in Europe. And it's not just in what they show on, on, uh, on uh, social media and TV. It's crazy in Europe. Europe is kaput completely. So Hashem is already showing the entire world what's going to happen. And then he says, okay, now you decide what you need to do. So the first things are if you are uh, good with Hashem. That's why I told you before, Hashem doesn't get impressed from suits and beards and yarmulkes. I'm telling you, I know some people with beards and yarmulkes, Hashem erachem, with reshaim. Wicked. With the beards and the yarmulkes and the entire Torah that they know. I just gave a lecture now in Encino the other day. I was nice. I, somebody said something. I said, well, take the consideration that 50% of the, what you see is Erev Rav. So the rabbi was quietly telling me 90%. I said, well, you said 90. I was about to say 99%. I was just being easy on the crowd. <laughs> but that's what I feel, see, and I know. The majority is fake, rotten. So the point here is you don't be that. If I'm connected to a crowd that I see something is not okay, uh, sorry, I can't be with you. When I do my own tshuva, it's me and Hashem. I don't do tshuva to impress you. I don't uh, change because I want to look better in the eyes of my followers. I'm, I'm, my issue is 100% with Hashem. So that's the message I'm offering you to leave this door tonight. That you have to understand that every person, Hashem looks at them. It doesn't matter if you're religious or not, if you observe Shabbat or not. Hashem doesn't look at you in that level. It's not that Hashem puts a bunch of people in front of them. He says, Shomer Shabbat, I love you. Not Shomer Shabbat, go here. <laughs> and the proof to that, and I get it all the 20 years I get it, that if you would look at me or any great rabbi would look at me 25 years ago, it wouldn't give me a time of day. It would throw me out of the shul. You know how many yeshivot I was thrown out of? Because I came and they just looked a little bit at my past. No, no, we don't want you here. Well, way before I was the famous Rabbi Anava. Most of the yeshivot that I came with, you know, they had some questionnaire. The second they found out a little bit of what's going on with me, we don't want you here. Not to talk about shiduchim. How many put says, oh, I'm with you, never. There was one woman, she, I, I, I'm, I'm saying it uh, just for the example. There was one, one time, a uh, girl that I saw and I asked to be matched with her. And then when it came to her Shadchanit, or whoever she was, she looked at me, she looked at me up, she was like, you never. 
Years later, she somehow saw me and she didn't even know how to digest that you never. And I wanted to tell her that, that, that you didn't think 10 years ago this is what's going to be. Ah, now I would be your number one uh, prize. So that's the arrogance and the stupidity and the disgusting of most people. Being so judgmental, so judgmental to the individual, how they dress, how they look, how they behave. You know where that person is going to be in 10 years? That you're looking at the individual and like... That's uh, the, the sublime message that I'm telling you, I told you that already. I look at people, I give them the utmost respect. I don't even know who they are yet. I don't know what they did in their life. Even if they look horrible, I learned a long time ago not to judge the book by its cover. A long time ago. And most people are so judgmental and that's why life fails them. Because they're judging other people, they look down at other people, they think they're God gifts to the world. They're not even willing to humble themselves a little bit down to listen to what another person has to say. You, when you're quiet, that's why I told you before, sign of wisdom, be quiet. Because when you're quiet, you listen to other people. 90% is junk. Most of what comes out of people's mouth is junk, stupid ideas. But here and there, you hear the gems. Every person has some smart thing to say because Hashem showed them something in life. You can learn from every individual, from a three-year-old. You can learn from our enemies. You can learn from everybody. So I want to, before I bless you, I want to uh, 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 summarize what we did now for the last hour plus. Life is measured by your achievements when they're done quietly, not when you scream at your achievements. I can put on the, on the, on the board a lot of my achievements, and I have a lot, Baruch Hashem. But that's not how you're measured in life. You're measured in life in your achievements, in refining yourself, in affecting other people in making room for other people in this world. And not to be arrogant, not to be snobby, not to be I'm much better. It's very easy to point fingers and say, I, uh, me. You want life to be smoother? Then you humble yourself. Your life, you want life to go uh, more smooth and according to your plans and not too much challenges? Then don't be an obstacle in other people's faces. Don't be judgmental. Don't be the ones who are ruining to other people. I know sometimes people did bad things to you. You want to have revenge. The more you humble yourself, the more successful you will be. It doesn't matter if your success is measured with money, fame, intelligence, uh, where my uh, uh, heritage, lineage, everybody, their success is measured somewhere else. For me, for many, many years, success was measured how much money you have. And then I understood that it doesn't matter because you can be a crook and you can get money like this. There's, there's no success here. Success is how much you are true to yourself and how much you achieve what you're supposed to do in this world. And like I told you, go and read after this class, the Yigeret Ramban, the, the letter of Nachmanides. It will change your life if you read it every day, if you internalize it and if you apply it. So, really, what we went through in the last hour is not my life story, is what you can take from my life story. I took already what I, I'm, I'm taking the maximum of my own life story. I'm try, trust me, I'm squeezing every little bit of my own experiences. I'm cashing in on every little thing. Half of my videos online, there are thousands of videos on YouTube. Half of them is my day-to-day -day stories that I, I let Hashem operate in my life and I see the miracles. And then I just tell, say, uh, say what Hashem did because that you're obligated. So, like I told you, that's my strong belief. Nobody's here by chance. You all were spiritually invited here by the master of the universe, not because somebody sent you a message or a WhatsApp or a text. Or and now uh, what is left is what are you taking home for, with you? Which souvenir are you taking out of the door? If you're smart, you're taking the spiritual souvenir by saying, I need to change something in my life. And drastic. I touched today 10 different things that each person can either do all 10 or one. You decide. You decide how you're going to become a better person tonight when you leave the room. If you do, then you won the lottery. Hashem has given you an opportunity. 
if you apply on it, you'll see that one aspect in your life will change for the best. But that depends on you. Put it to the test and you can call me later and tell me. But if you didn't put any effort, you walked in through the door and you're going to walk out of the door exactly the same, maybe a little bit more inspired. But if you don't do something, then nothing will change in your life. And then you'll see all the signs down the road. Ah, if I would have done three months ago, I'm telling you that Hashem wants to see you constantly changing for the good, not changing bad. So if you walk out of this door tonight and you're saying, what can I take from this guy? Determination? Okay, I'll take determination. What am I going to take from him? Uh, not to judge other people? Okay, I'm going to stop judging other people. But if you don't take something, the Mishnah calls it Yatsas Charo Befsedo. That you, you, you know on the way out you get like a bag after a, 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 a birthday party, they give you a baggie. Uh, a what? Well, how? Goodie bag. goodie bag. Okay, so Hashem is giving you goodie bags. You decide which goodie bag you take out of this party. That's it. If you don't, uh, listen, you can take some of the food. This is very good goodie bar, but bag. But you, besides calories, you don't get nothing. You already made an effort. You're already sitting here. I have done my part. You leave the door how you want to leave tonight. If you're smart, you take one thing and you apply it. I changed my entire life one step at a time, not 50 at the same time. One thing, I took it on myself, I applied it, I put it into the system that it became so part of the system and then I took another thing. But we're all looking for some, some relief in our life, some mental, emotional relief in our life. Hashem is putting so much pressure right now on everybody I, I told it to somebody the other day. He told me, why do you think Hashem is putting so much pressure? Everybody's going through some pressure. So I said, he wants, so, uh, uh, the person says, Hashem wants everybody to do tshuva, right? I said, yeah, that's part of the reasons. So he says, why do you think Hashem is putting so much pressure? So I said, because he wants people to observe Shabbat. Because on Shabbat, you don't use the phone. The bank doesn't call. The business, no, nobody's calling you on Shabbat. I mean, on Shabbat, you can really have an excuse to turn the switch off. Nothing bothers you in this world. Really? That's what I do. Shabbat, I disconnect from this world completely. I hate Motzei Shabbat because then I have to open the phone, start dealing with everything. With the bank, credit cards, mortgage, loans, people, headaches, all the headaches. You open the phone, Motzei Shabbat, ding, 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 all the way, WhatsApps, right? And you don't want to open half of them. So Hashem is uh, now putting this pressure so we will be, <laughs> you know, focused on the Shabbat, but it doesn't have to be like this. A person who is, that is doing his tshuva, his, hers, and he's good with Hashem, then with all the challenges around you, life is going to be much less hectic. So I'm going to uh, first recommend that you take something and you apply it. I guarantee to you, you'll see a change in one aspect of your life. Whatever you choose, you'll see how it's affecting you. And I will leave you with a blessing that whenever, whatever you decide to take, that Hashem should bless you, it will be easy and you'll be able to go through with it. And you'll make a good decision, a strong hachlata, but that you're able to do that. You know, for many, many years, all I've heard from many different places, you have to take a decision and apply. You need to, to take a decision, it's easy. To know how to apply hard, to do it repetitively, almost impossible. How, much, how many times in your past you did a hachlata, a good decision, and it lasted three days? Or maybe a week or two weeks, and then somehow it fades. So tonight you have a strong opportunity, an auspicious time to take a decision and to say, I, I don't want to be that when the whole world is under judgment, that I will be the good kid of the class and say, I didn't do anything. That's how I look at it, because I can't change the entire world, but I have to change myself. That when Hashem is going to come, I say, listen, I, I didn't say Lashon Allah. I, I, I never lied. I didn't cheat. I, I'm like, I try to affect the world, but on myself, I don't want to be caught under one of these channels of, of judgment. Chas v'shalom. So I'm going to bless you all to be successful in any path that you decide to take, assuming that it's positive, that you should all have true happiness in your heart, find true peace in your heart, have strong health, long life, that you should marry off your kids, marry off grandkids. If you need to get married, Sandra Torah, Chupa, Simtovim, Parnasa should be easy. 
health should be strong. You should have true irat shamayim, true love to Hashem. And the Hashem should always guide you wherever you need to, to go and provide to you whatever you need to, 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 in order to reach to that place and provide to you the, the true love and peace in your heart that you should be successful. And, and everything that you should do should be, cause nachat to the Kadosh Baruch Hu. Yes.